Nothing makes quite as big a splash of color in the garden as annuals do. Plus, they're easy to grow. Any beginning gardener can grow a beautiful bed of annuals like this. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll give you some pointers on growing annuals, and we'll introduce you to some that you may not have thought of growing, even if you're an experienced gardener. On Gardening Naturally. is a plant that completes its whole life cycle in one season. It grows to maturity, sets seed, and then dies. And that's why annuals bloom so enthusiastically. The plants seem to know that they have only a short period of time in which to set seed and reproduce themselves. Now some of the plants that we grow as annuals in climates where there is a lot of cold weather are actually perennials somewhere else, like this Nicodiana, for instance. And speaking about cold weather, you need to know the difference between hardy annuals and tender annuals. Hardy annuals will stand some frost. The tender annuals are killed by it. For example, this calendula will stand a little bit of frost at the beginning of the season and also the end, whereas this zinnia cannot take either. Now, it's important to know whether an annual you're planting is a tender or a hardy one, because that determines when you plant it. Now, this past spring, we put in a whole new bed of annuals starting from scratch. And we're going to show you how we did that. I decided I wanted a new flower garden this year that was just annuals, one that I till up every year and make it a little different each spring. So I chose this nice sunny block of lawn right at the end of my rose and flower garden over here. And I decided to make it about 4 feet by 12 feet. So I needed to stake it out, and what I did was I sighted down the edge of that garden and pounded in some stakes with a dead blow mallet. The next step was to stretch a garden line tightly around each peg. To edge it, I took a good, sturdy garden spade, the flat kind, no scoop to it when you're edging, and I just made a good straight line. and loosened the soil a little bit as I went. Now the next step was to remove the sod. Now I have several choices about how I can do that. I could put an herbicide down, which would work after a few weeks, but I'm concerned about the effects on me, the neighboring plants, and the soil. Another good way would be to put down black plastic, and after a year, all the grass would be smothered. But I wouldn't want to look at black plastic in this particular part of the yard for a year. A more attractive way to do it would be to put down newspaper and then a heavy mulch on top, but again, more appropriate to an out-of-the-way section of the garden. And again, I would have to wait about a year. So I'm just going to remove it mechanically. After I take the sod off, I have a few choices as to what I'm going to do with it. An excellent thing would be to put it on the compost heap along with my other compost materials. And after about a year, I'd have a wonderful soil amendment to put back on one of my gardens. But in this case, we want an instant lawn and a section over here to go with our instant annual garden. So we're going to remove these and put them where they're going to make a lawn over there. Now, in order to do that in a very tidy fashion, I put down a ruler like this so that I could cut in one foot increments along the ruler to make nice one foot by one foot squares, just as if I were laying linoleum in the bathroom. It's also a nice, easy, manageable size to remove. Now, next step is how we remove it. If this were a big garden, I might even consider renting a sod removing machine. But for something this size, even I can do it. I come in like this, getting down on my knee, because we have a rocky soil. But as you can see, it comes up. Now you might want to see how little topsoil you can remove if you're concerned about leaving topsoil in the garden. On the other hand, since we're reusing this as a lawn, I don't mind having enough clinging to the roots to help that lawn establish. I'm also trying not to leave roots in the soil that are going to come up later. 
We can always replenish this. I'll show you how to do that in a little while. Hi, Barbara. I'm ready for the sod. Well, it's all ready for you. Well, good. I could use some help with the tilling, though, Elliot. Oh, I'll be glad to help, and I'll bring you back the fertilizer when I come. Okay, good. We're going to have to put some soil back into this bed because we've removed several inches. Now, the ideal thing, it's so much homemade compost this year that we could put several inches of that in the bed and fill it in. But we didn't, and usually you probably won't have either. We could get some topsoil. That would work. Or we could create our own topsoil. Do you want this opened? Sure. There's uh, four bags, 40 pounds each, and I think that should give us a layer of about, oh, maybe half an inch. I'm going to want to rake all of this smooth, distribute it evenly around the bed. And I got a big nylon tooth rake, which does a great job of it. ready for the fertilizer. Barbara calculated from the square footage of this bed exactly how much fertilizer is necessary according to the recommendations on the bag. There's the green sand. Yeah, I weighed it on a kitchen scale and I figured I needed a, a cup and a half of this. Now you can use a scoop. That works pretty well. I'll need some phosphorus for good root development. Here you are. We're using phosphate rock. Phosphate rock is an excellent source of natural phosphate. Now we'll need some nitrogen for good stem and leaf development, but not too much, and we'll get all leaf and no flowers. Our favorite nitrogen source to meet all those requirements is alfalfa meal, which is merely just dried alfalfa leaves. Now normally I would add some lime to a bed like this one because we have acid soil, but we heavily limed this lawn last fall, so we're going to hold off on the lime for now. This is our favorite mix of ingredients. But you could also go buy some all-purpose organic fertilizer. This is a 462 mixture, and that would do a good job, too. Now, we still need some bulk in here and lots more organic matter. So I have this bale of peat moss, which is four cubic feet. It's going to do the job nicely. That'll put on about one inch of it over the entire bed. Where we've taken the sod off, we've taken most of the topsoil. And the most important thing to add back in order to improve this is organic matter. The easiest way to do that is just cut open a bag of peat moss all the way around in a circle and dump it all over the bed. And then we'll rake this level before we mix it in. The next thing is to get all of this good stuff tilled into the soil. If you have a rototiller, this is a good job for it. If you don't, you can use a digging fork like this one go like that. Time to get down in there and start flipping it over. Might have to go through several times. We got a lot of peat in here, Elliot. That's good. Maybe a couple of inches. But oh. you know, there's a lot of roots in here still, little tiny ones that aren't going to regrow, but they're enough to make the digging a little slow going. Right. In a case like that, a mattock like this might be a better tool. And you use this in a quick chopping motion, working away from you as you go down the bed. Now, what that does is effectively mix with the soil underneath, even though it has a lot of roots in it, that wonderful sandwich of materials we put on here, the compost, the minerals, and the peat moss. Now, I won't say this is easy work, but it's very effective, and you want these things mixed in thoroughly. In fact, I'm sort of like a human rototiller right here. No home should be without one. <laughs> It's been about two weeks since Elliot and I tilled up this bed. After we'd finished tilling, we really moistened it. We went back and forth over it with a hose and really let the water sink in because we had used peat moss in the soil, and peat can really dry it out. We didn't pre-moisten the peat, however, because that would have made the soil too soggy to work. So here we were, ready to plant. And we had to look at our annuals and think, well, which ones are tender annuals and which ones are hardy ones? The hardy ones are the ones that can take a little bit of frost at the beginning of the season in the spring and the end of the season in fall. And we sowed those right away. You'll notice that there's some little linarias coming up very thickly. And I've learned from experience with this plant that I can let them come up that way without thinning. They have spindly stems and it helps to hold their heads up if there's a lot of them there. 
On the other hand, this salvia viridis over here, which is coming in really nicely after a planting two weeks ago, will need to be thinned. Each one of these little seedlings is going to make a big bushy plant. So I'm going to thin these widely to about 10 or 12 inches apart. So I'll leave this one here, pull out this one, pull out this one, leave that one, take him, him, leave that nice one, move the one next to it out, and leave that one, and so on down the row. So I have a spacing that will give me a row of good vigorous plants, each one with room for its root system to grow. Now that takes care of the hardy annuals. What about the tender ones? Most of the plants we grow are tender annuals, and we start them indoors in soil blocks because we have such a short growing season. This may not be the case for you. If you live in a warm climate, you may find that you can direct sow all of your plants. But in our case, we really need to do this. Now, what we need to do with the tender annuals is figure out when the safe date to plant is, and that's the date in which we know we're not going to have a frost. And it's, it varies whatever part of the country you're in, Call your local extension service or ask at one of your garden centers or your neighbors to see what that date is. Now the tender annuals are going to be put in usually as seedlings like this and we'll have to again think about how we place them. These are going to be about 10 to 12 inches apart because they're scabioses and they're going to be about three feet high. This matricaria over here will form tidy little low mounds so I put those about six to eight inches apart. Okay, I think I'm going to plant some little red marigolds over here in the front. These are only going to be about a foot tall. And what I'm going to do is set out the plants first so that I can get a good idea of how they're going to be spaced before I commit myself to making holes. And I think maybe I'll get five in there, and if I stagger the row, it'll be better. Okay, I think that'll work. So I'll take a little sawed-off trowel with this kind of motion, make a hole and bury the stem about half an inch, making sure that I have the shoulder of the soil block covered because there's a lot of peat moss in this mix and the soil block can dry out if I don't cover it with the garden soil, which is moisture. Okay, in they go. Now, I think I have just enough room to plant a few nasturtiums. These can go in straight from seed. So what I'm going to do is make a little furrow like this, about an inch deep, which is deeper than you'd plant small seeds. But as you can see, nasturtium seeds are quite large. And I'm going to poke those in there like that, about two inches apart. And then when those are up, which will be pretty soon, because these sprout quickly, I'll thin those till they're about six or eight inches apart. Cover up the furrow, pat it. And those should be very nice there. They're kind of a peach color. I think that'll go nicely in this garden. Okay, I still have an awful lot of annuals here and I've used up all the space in my annual gardens, but I have a good place for the rest. I'm gonna put some over in my perennial garden. Come on, I'll show you. Now the nice thing about this perennial bed is that all of these things are coming up by themselves. And what are fairly small clumps now are gonna be really big later on. But there are a few gaps and I like to fill those with annuals because they'll help keep it in continuous bloom since they bloom over such a long period of time. I really have to be careful though. When I look at it right now, the gaps seem bigger than they actually are because this peony is gonna come out to about this size. This balloon flower, which is so tiny now, is gonna be a nice clump. And so really, I just have a small gap here that I can plant. So instead of putting a plant here, 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 and here, I'm gonna take three plants these are a nice bushy red cosmos. It gets to be just about two feet tall. It'll be just gray here. And I'll probably plant them just like that. Okay, let's do it. Did you know that some flowers are edible? Well, they are. In fact, they make wonderful garnishes for a lot of different dishes. And one of the most fun things about having a garden full of flowers is to find ways to use them in cooking. In fact, a lot of things are blooming right now that I'm going to put in tonight's dinner. My salad of spring greens is all set here, and I'm just going to behead some Johnny Jump Ups and sprinkle them through it 
If I were going to put a dressing on this salad, I'd do it before the flowers so they don't get tossed in and hidden. Very often, I will just pass the dressing separately when I do a flower salad and let people add their own. Oh, love that. Okay, how about some pansies? Same theme, but bigger. And complimentary colors. Great. You know, the neat thing about this time of year is that some of my vegetable crops are blooming, too. Here's one you may not have heard of. It's called Claytonia. Its uh, other name is miner's lettuce, and it's actually a California weed, and it has a crisp, succulent, mild flavor. And at this time of year, a little white flower right in the center of the leaf. So I'm going to scatter some of those through the salad, and they'll taste great and look pretty. And the watercress is blooming, too. Look at this. Tastes wonderful in salads. Let's take off some of the tougher stems at the bottom and scatter the white flowers on top. And not last but not least, here are some chives that are blooming. And we can just toss those in on the top. And they have that same bitey, oniony flavor that the leaves of the chives have. Oh, that's so elegant. You know, the neat thing about this is that the summer is moving along, and as each month changes in the garden, the color picture changes in my salads as well. Well, it looks like my efforts in spring paid off. These salvias make nice, big, bushy clumps in shades of purple and pink and white. And this matricaria also, big, bushy plants with just a sea of tiny white blossoms. And hovering over them all, those tall scabiosas that I planted in a mix of colors, pale lavenders and white and a purpley shade that's just starting to open now. I think the nicest thing I, I did in this bed was put in these annual chrysanthemums in a shade called Primrose Gem. It's such a pale yellow and so subtle that I can even mix it with these purpley red shades of toad flax without them even clashing. They also go very well with these tiny little orange marigolds and the deep orange and salmon mix of the nasturtiums that I put in here. And check out this white alyssum. It's much bigger and bushier and more open than the typical little edging alyssums that you usually see. But it's more heat resistant, I'm finding, and much more fragrant. It's the real old-fashioned kind. When I walk by this bed, I get a blast of perfume just from this white alyssum. Now, we've got some interesting things going on over here. I repeated the theme I did over there with the Matricaria feverfew is its common name. And look how nice it is with this love in a mist, nigella. Pretty blue flowers and kind of ferny foliage, looking very nice with this red-orange cosmos the cosmos sulfurous type that doesn't get very tall. Now here's some interesting scabiosis. I think that the flower is rather sweet and charming, but the real focal point is these seed heads that get very papery and dry and look good in flower arrangements. And this is one of my old favorites, blue lace flower, a very true blue plant and a lovely old fashioned cutting flower. I really was into the blue purple range in this bed too. I grew brachycomb, or Swan River Daisy, a plant I haven't grown in years, and I'd forgotten how dazzling it is when it's in full bloom. And then over here, mixing in with all of these blues, I direct sowed some California poppies, one of my absolute favorites. It's a California native, and I'm trying to get more and more into growing some native annuals. I also planted some gallardia, or blanket flower, which is a native of the American Southwest. And here's another native annual I bet you've never seen. It's a wild annual bee balm. It'll self-sow in this part of the garden. I'm really into old-fashioned annuals, too. For instance, this zinnia is called Youth and Old Age. And it gets its name from the fact that the flowers start out a bright color and fade to different shades of darker red. And so you see them all together in different shades on the same plant. These annual hollyhocks or another example. Look how simple and charming they are with just that single flower. And this corn cockle, too. You don't see this much in gardens anymore, but it's a great cut flower on long, wavy stems. Now, here's an annual 
that's really adaptable to poor, dry soil. If you have a patch like that in your garden, as I do, it's a type of portulaca called afternoon delight that stays open all day long. Now, on the other hand, if you have a partly shaded part of the garden, such as this one over here, why don't you try Cyanoglossum or Chinese forget-me-not? Did you ever see such a beautiful, intense blue? And I think it looks great blooming with those bright orange pansies. That's a variety called Podporaja. Another annual that's worked out pretty well for me in part shade is this Nerembergia, which is just covered with little white blooms on low trailing stems. The great thing about growing annuals is that the more you pick them, the more flowers you have. For instance, this zinnia variety is appropriately named Cut and Come Again. So don't hold back. No matter how many you cut to decorate the house, there'll still be plenty in the garden. The other thing I love about annuals, Elliot, is that we can start from scratch each year with a whole different color scheme. Even if the selection at your local garden center is limited, consult any seed catalog and you'll find there are dozens and dozens of different ones that you can grow from seed. Yeah, I very much want to try some heliotrope next year for fragrance. That'd be great. And how about those little yellow Dahlberg daisies? Excellent. Well, we've got the whole winter to decide. For now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Homebodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.